Hi, welcome to Cinema Then, Cinema Now, the film series with lively discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach cinema studies at the College of Staten Island of the City University of New York. Today, we continue and, in fact, conclude our five-part series, The French New Wave, 30 Years Later. We began the series with Jean-Luc Godard's Breathless, and today we end with one of his greatest films, Vivre Sa Vie, My Life to Live. We have today two guests, as usual. They'll be discussing a set of things about the film, its place in Godard's work, the culminating effect of the French New Wave, and, uh, let us say, the effect that this film has had on a whole generation of filmmakers. Those two guests are Professor Annette Michelson, founder and editor of October Magazine, and Professor Jonathan Buxbaum of Queens College of the City University of New York. Enjoy. Vivre sa vie. Or, or uh, Fellini, Antonioni, or whatever. Hi, welcome back to Cinema Then, Cinema Now. I hope you enjoyed Godard's marvelous, intriguing, complicated, to say the least. Uh, vivre sa vie. I think a, a fit ending to our five-part series on the French uh, New Wave. Let me take this moment to introduce to you our two guests for today, and then we'll move on to the real stuff, as it were. Uh, to my left is one of my colleagues from the City University of New York, Professor, Professor Jonathan Buxbaum. Uh, Jonathan teaches at uh, Queens College. He's uh, written a number of articles on his central intellectual interest, which is the, re which is the relationship between politics and the cinema. Uh, most recently, he has published a book, A Cinema Engagé, which is issued by the University of Illinois Press, which is on the particular nature of political cinema in France in the, 19, uh, in the 1930s. Uh, sitting to my right is Professor Annette Michelson, uh, Annette's academic affiliation is New York University, where she teaches in the Cinema Studies uh, program. She's perhaps best known to many of our viewers as um, the founder and one of the editors of October, the, the distinguished journal of theory and criticism of the arts. Uh, I should also mention at this point that several years ago, Annette wrote an introduction to the reissuing of the anthology of Godard's early writings, Godard on Godard. Well, Annette, uh, let's stick with you for the moment. Um, as, as we were chatting um, before the show, uh, this series began with Breathless and ends with Vivre, Vivre Sabi. What are your thoughts on the relationship between Breathless and Vivre Sa Sabi? First of all, let me say that I think to begin and to end with a Godard film is a wonderful way to encapsulate what is, I think, most important about the renewal of French cinema uh, in the period of the late 1950s through, let us say, about 1970. Um, I see Vive Sa Vie, first of all, as one of the most extraordinary films in the history of the medium, and also as a pivotal work in Godard's enterprise. And the reason is that although in Breathless, uh, something quite extraordinary happens. It's made in 1959, as I remember. And one finds in Breathless the beginnings of um, a number of things that Godard was later to do. That is to say, things which were to change uh, our whole notion right. of what cinema is. Uh, it is, I think, nevertheless, uh, in Vif Sa Vie that we get the first truly intensive and systematic development of 
uh, his innovations. Breathless has, of course, the famous jump cuts. Right. But essentially, as Godard himself has claimed, he was involved in trying to make differently a conventional narrative, right. to work against the series of conventions that Hollywood had developed for narrative. But Vif Sa Vie does something else. Uh, in fact, it does a number of other things. And it initiates what will come to be uh, Godard's uh, extensive and radical uh, critique of cinematic representation. Right. And some of those things uh, which we find are, first of all, the relation within this film of uh, the document to fiction, the existence of a, a certain kind of documentary narration or discourse within this fiction. Secondly, the breaking of the f film up into discrete episodes. Right, an ep a life in 12 episodes. Yes. And, uh, and as we know, it's at this time that Brecht's work is beginning to be very well known in France. The uh, Berliner group uh, have been there recently. Uh, they've produced enormous effect on all of French intellectual life, not just the theater, and uh, upon Godard as well. And what we find in this film is that constant kind of reference to other kinds of cultural discourses, um, the novel among right. them, um, to poetry, uh, and of course uh, a very, very different way of organizing the relation between sound and image. That is to say, in this film we get the initiation of what will become for Godard a very, very constant kind of preoccupation. The attempt to dissociate, analyze, and in some way resynthesize and redefine the relationship of sound to image. One more thing. Sure, do it. I see you raising your hand. One more <laughs> thing I want to point to. <laughs> and it is the introduction into uh, Godard's work of the thematics of prostitution, which is going mm -hmm. to develop and in a number of different ways, which will uh, be treated n narratively in terms of a kind of documentary approach, but also will come uh, to stand as a metaphor uh, for much of human activity within the period of late capitalism. So I do see this film as not only pivotal, uh, but as momentous in its later developments. Well, and it's one of those films, I mean, uh, you you began by saying something that's w well worth repeating, that is for you, this is one of the central films of the medium. This yes. is one of those revolutionary texts that changes not just one thing, but a whole set of things. Just for a moment, I want to get back to this relationship between Breathless and Viva, mm -hmm. Viva Savi, because um, one of the things that strikes me, and I think I'm just following from what you've said, is that uh, Breathless, as we discussed on that show, owes so much to uh, film noir and the American crime film as that as this narr narrative skeleton upon which are hung or juxtaposed or a set of other kinds of references, distancing techniques, whatever. But somehow that skeleton remains. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it upends a lot of the hierarchical relationships within a text, but it remains there. Now, for me, Vivre Sans Vie is the film in which you don't have that thing. You have so many discrete forms of text and representation that uh, lace themselves through this with, without having that thing it's being laced, uh, laced to. Did you, do you go along with that as part of the aspect of the break? Or Yes, I think, I think that in a sense, Vif Saint V attempts to do something else. Uh, but that something else is, I think, an early and a sustained preoccupation of Godard. And that is to erase the barriers, to do something to erase the barriers between those two poles of the film, which were represented presumably in its early period by Lumière and Méliès. That is to say, Godard uh, really believes in the necessity of erasing those barriers. He says so in different ways, yeah. at different times. And Vif Sa Vie, I think, is after Le Petit Soldat, which is a somewhat difficult parenthetical film, I think it's his first successful attempt to do that. Godard really believes that he can have 
and that therefore his, can, his spectators can have the best of both possible right. worlds. Right. Well, one of the things that we'd been chatting about earlier that, that Annette's already brought up, Jonathan, is this new concept or this exploratory concept of the relationship of sound and, and, and image in this film. Well, I'd like to first comment on something that you raised a moment ago okay. about this nature of a narrative. Because you have to specify, I think, what you mean by a narrative. And you refer to, let's say, conventions of Hollywood cinema. And in fact, part of that convention of the narrative is characterization. Absolutely. And you do have a discussion and interest, a kind of experimentation on the nature of characterization, I think, in the film. Therefore, from the beginning to the end, you have a kind of examination of how character is produced. And it's not a traditional form of characterization. In this sense, we have perhaps a Brechtian approach to a character where the character is sometimes perhaps a character in a fiction, right. at other times a character in a mini documentary, as we see when she's performing her tasks while Raoul the pimp is describing, in response to her question, what a prostitute has to do. Begins with a conversation in the car, which is a synchronized conversation, presumably part of the fiction. Right. Then we move to, with the same conversation continuing on the soundtrack, a mini documentary about what prostitution is. Yet, the soundtrack has remained the same. The, Im the relation between image and sound, however, has radically changed how we're to understand what this sequence is about. And frankly, we cannot use one category, one formal category even, to characterize what is the sequence. Is it a fictional sequence? Is it a documentary sequence? So we do have here, very literally, I think, an erasure of that opposition, if you like, which Annette was referring to earlier by referring to Melias and Lumiere. And Godard repeatedly says he sees himself as an essayist. Sometimes he says he sees himself as an essayist starting from fiction and moving to documentary, and sometimes in the other direction. And I think in this film, moving on to, let's say, relations between sound and image, throughout virtually all of the sequences, you have an investigation of how sound can relate to image, such that sometimes you see shots of the street, absolutely silent. Sometimes you hear snatches of music, which are traditional kinds of music over. They're cut in the middle of a shot. Over the credit sequence, all of a sudden, the sound is attenuated. We're left with a space that's now silent, whereas before there was a music over, which is perfectly familiar. But it's as if Godard is so familiar with the conventions of Hollywood cinema that he can no longer use them straight. Yeah. He has to somehow subject them to some transformation, some permutation. Um, and I think actually one of the interesting displays of that occurs when she's in the cafe and someone puts on a record on the jukebox, which is a romantic uh, song sung by a man about his girlfriend. And we see her at one point in close shot. And she's apparently listening and the camera moves in as if suggesting her psychology. Right. That we're to interpret this as a comment on either what she's thinking or what her character is. But then Godard cuts to a couple sitting at a table. And now is the song about them? But it's the principle of the relation between sound and image, which I think interests Godard here, not what is really going on inside the so-called psychology of Anna Karina or Nana. Or in the film. To, I mean, to, to put it another way, uh, um, he's interested in exploring what the conventions of representing the interior states of the characters are, as opposed to displaying those interior states. Well, or is that too I think that's an overly formalistic way of presenting it. I mean, as Annette said, mm -hmm. this is on some level a film trying to get at the notion of prostitution right. perhaps, or introducing the topic, which he will develop at greater length in his later films. But I think he's addressing a problem. The problem is, among others in the film, how do you cinematically deal with the question of interiority? 
And I think he's trying to display that examination to us. And increasingly through his career, he will apply different experiments of the sort we see emerge here, though they were not submerged in Breathless, but I think we see the, them emerge here more clearly in terms of his constant interests. So that rather than think of it as he's just playing with conventions, no, he's searching for a way to say something about a contemporary situation, such as the, the situation of women, such as the presentation of interiority. Well, uh, to defend myself for the moment, um, I, I guess what I was after was the fact that there are those filmmakers who use these conventional mi means who are sure about their claims about what they can tell us about the interior states. And it's part of this process of interrogation on Godard's part is that he, he really is, he is, he is searching. So he, he knows he wants to show those states, but he must find a new way of rendering it or testing, or testing those limits, or there's this possibility of, of uh, the dishonesty that I think he fears uh, most. And also, he's not always certain that he's going to be able to get those, uh, those states. And it's that uh, lack of certainty, I think, that's, that's extremely intriguing to me, that he would want to go after it, and yet he would, at the same time, encode ways in the film of saying, I'm not sure if I've gotten it or not. Well, if I can continue our disagreement sure. and <laughs> toss it back to Annette for the moment, I think that he's not trying to convey an interior state. And what I'm referring to with Annette is perhaps the conversation with Brice Parin later in the film when he talks specifically about the problem of language versus thought. Yes, but I think I want to go back to an earlier formulation about the notion of interiority. One of the things about Godard uh, and his work is that one can trace through it um, a great deal of what is being thought and said and done within that very important transitional historical period, which is work occupies. And one of the things, um, one of the things one notices in Godard's, a very, uh, in all his work, is an extraordinary series of references to the intellectual milieu right. within yes. which he evolves. Now, those references change. Uh, they begin with Sartre, and uh, they end, uh, well, where they end, we do we not don't know. We don't know, but, but they <laughs> certainly traverse. <laughs> they, they traverse uh, a kind of enormous territory. And, um, and in this film, still, Sartre's influence is very evident. And it has to do with the concept of how you reach uh, notions of interiority, how you can, in effect, uh, describe interiority. And Godard does it um, by a kind of uh, extremely uh, interesting and lucid descriptive process. That is to say, he avoids, in fact, as Jonathan has just said, um, the projection of psychological states right. using the conventions that were then, until then, in use. But what he does is, is to adopt um, the, the principles which had been elaborated by uh, the philosophical school um, of, uh, from which Sartre himself emerged, and the feeling that uh, a very, very close and observant and, and sensitive description of outer behavior could, in fact, project interiority. Yeah. He is of the same generation as Rupier, essentially. Yes. Um, and though the films have a kind of joy and a kind of uh, gaiety, and they're involved also with the, the chronicling of, of, of French youth during that period, uh, nevertheless, uh, in that uh, notion of, of the problem of the rendering of interiority, he must be seen as related to the novelists, let's say, of that school, which was called New. Would you, uh, uh, would you trace that back, it's intellectual, would you trace it back to Flaubert as the sort of starter of this, I mean, you know, of the tendency, if not the first full practitioner of it? I, I'm thinking, of course, the controversy about Madame Bovary over its, its um, licentious qualities, et cetera, the, the famous trial, and of course, the, the, the king, the linchpin for a lot of those arguments were in fact descriptive passages.
Um, and so there's this, uh, there is a tradition. I think that is possible. I think that is possible. And I think, by the way, that, that Godard would have been very attracted by the idea that of Flaubert's that uh, essentially uh, Normandy and Constantinople were equally subjects <laughs> for you know, uh, exploration and uh, artistic endeavor. But, but to get back more concretely and, sure. and centrally to the films, um, to this film, uh, it seems to me that, um, first of all, the, the kind of objectivity with which Nana is observed, uh, which um, Jonathan's remarked on, the insertion of the, st not only the documentary, but the, the statistical treatment yeah. of, um, the, uh, of prostitution in the, in the region of Paris, and uh, is linked to the consideration of language and the part that language plays in um, the sequence to which Jonathan referred and which shows us Nana in a cafe. She leads her life mostly in cafes and other public places, as do not only uh, prostitutes in Paris, but um, most of us at that <laughs> time. <laughs> the housing situation <laughs> being what it was. And Paris is built for that. For that. It, it, uh, Paris is built for you know, intimacy okay. in public places. Um, but uh, it shows her then sort of posing questions and receiving very puzzling answers from a philosopher, uh, Boris Parin, yeah. who, by the way, had been the subject of an essay of Sartre's, which I translated many years ago. And uh, uh, f it, it's very interesting when you see that scene. The first thing that strikes you, by the way, is the extraordinary play on um, a skin texture mm. uh, between Parin and, uh, and Karina, yeah. uh, the, the youth and age, um, uh, thought and, if we can call it, action. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the, uh, Godard has maximized the contrasts. And in doing so, he sets up some kind of, kind of wonderful physical paradigm for uh, the various kinds of antitheses that, that are then discussed. Um, between thought and action, between language and silence. Um, so what, what I want to stress there is the way in which um, the conceptual and philosophical implications, right. let's say, of Godard's discourse are, are really rooted in, in the concrete at every point. And yeah. to pick up on this idea of the exchange in a mm -hmm. conversation of this sort, where Karina presumably is being fed lines on some level that Godard has given her to pose to the philosopher, we can see in this film the beginning of the emergence of or the insertion of Godard's voice, literally his voice, which we hear on two separate occasions in the film. One of them is, uh, has been remarked upon, I think, often in the oval portrait sequence when the young man is reading the book and we hear Godard's voice on the soundtrack talking about his wife who is the main actress in the film, that is she's the central character, Nana. But I think this is interesting in relation to what you were saying earlier regarding the new novel in that we never, see, we never hear the voice of a narrator or the voice of an author inserted like that into this descriptive prose, which is an attempt to be entirely flat and purely descriptive. We see in Godard the new novel. in the new novel, right, exactly, yes. but we here we see or we hear Godard, though at one point he apparently is in the scene in the cafe when Raoul asks whether she's a cheap whore or whether she's refined. Someone says off screen, why don't you, ask, why don't you just insult her and see sh how she reacts? If she laughs, it means she's refined. <laughs> That's Godard's voice. And he at one point looks, that is Raoul, looks over as if to acknowledge the suggestion, which he then proceeds to take, and poses it to Nana. But throughout the film, then, you have Godard himself trying to figure out what his role should be in this cinematic examination. So that in this last sequence, he uses a story. I mean, this could be a reference to the much spoken about reflexivity in Godard's film, which, I mean, maybe is less interesting now than it was once spoken of more. 
But we have a story about an author, a uh, painter, and he's painting a portrait of his wife. And as the wife takes shape on the canvas, the wife begins to die. And in a sense, Godard is perhaps meditating on his role as the filmmaker, filming his young, beautiful wife in this film, where he is now actually entered on some level into the text of the film. And he will do that increasingly in his career such that we'll understand very clearly that this is Godard's voice as opposed to being a surrogate for a character in the film as he is in this one. Well, that's the way in which he, he breaks up this notion of a, of a single authorized narrating agency in, uh, in, a, in a film that we uh, I think we associate uh, perhaps a little simplistically with the classical Hollywood cinema that somehow there's a controlling narrating agency for this. And this comes back to what you were chatting about earlier. I mean, this notion of this being a text of texts. Um, mm -hmm. And that uh, somehow what we get of the film comes out of this, uh, I think, collision of different kinds of authorities that come from the different kinds of texts presented within the film, uh, film itself. Well, it seems to me that within this film, the play of texts is complex, but certainly not as complex as it will later become. And I think what one thing one should mention is that, um, of course, there is a, a great difference between what we would call the authorial voice and the actual empirical um, yeah. narrating right. voice of the, uh, <coughs> of the filmmaker, which intervenes. But that empirical narrating voice uh, will, in a film, I think in many ways related to this one, perhaps his most closely related film, uh, A Married Woman, which is the other side of the coin. Right. Uh, of perhaps the coin of marriage as a form of prosti legal prostitution. Um, but in that film, the uh, author's voice uh, becomes a kind of whispering voice that yes. intervenes, as it were, between uh, what we see as the narration, intercepted, by the way, by a, a number of monologues, and uh, 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 between then the narration and um, and the image, as it were. And it, it's, it's, it's a whispering, slightly nagging, whispering, persistent voice that is always with us, at least through a great part mm -hmm. of the film. And so that um, I think what we're getting in this film is the beginning, again, of a, of a process that will, um, or of a kind of strategy that will undergo a number of interesting permutations. Uh, in the rest of course, of I'm us also work. thinking that, that this this whispering voice becomes not only important to Godard but to others because the the last year at Marienbad begins with the uh, of Renee, uh, written by Rogrier begins with a whispering voice that you can't quite tell what it's saying and it keeps speaking and speaking and then it becomes clearer and uh, and, and clearer and there are various times in which the voice is more or less audible and that's not. Uh, from the view of, viewpoint of certain very conventional films, that would be, you know, distressing. You're supposed to be able to know what's happening, where this is the sliding. I'm not to say that it's an identical thing. Uh, no, go on. No, I think, I think it has different function. In okay, please China. explain that. Well, it would take a while. Okay. <laughs> but I think it really has a different function. First of all, what we hear is going to be repeated. It's cyclical. So yes. it's like, it's like, it's almost like a piece, uh, an orchestra tuning up and getting into yes, it. Yes, yes. In the last year at Marienbad, yes. you're speaking of, yes, of course. Yes, it is. And, and it has a different function because it, it has a ritualistic function. Right. And uh, it has the function of a preamble or, or a prelude to what is about to happen and so on. Um, in Godard, it's very different. But this, this factor of not, a, not always being able to hear, in the very first sequence, of course, of Vive Sa Vie, we have this extraordinary. Um, uh, strategy of Godard's in which we see Nana and her husband, whom we are not ready to see again during the film, um, from the back in a cafe right. in which a lot of noise is going on. People are playing slot, uh, slot machine. Pinball, pinball. Pinball, 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 pinball machine. Pinball machine. Baby foot <laughs> in French. And, um, and the noise, the environing noise is such that we don't hear the conversation very well. 
uh, we in you, you can make it out very well if you're looking at a subtitled um, well, English yes, version yes. of it. But if you are looking at it without subtitles, you really don't hear it all that well. And you know, Godard has a very interesting text. It's a review of a film by Alexandre Ostrich of a Maupassant novel called A Life in V with Maria Schell, in which he talks about Astrich's ability to film a, uh, a space, and here it was, I think, Corsica, uh, the honeymoon of Corsica, um, such that, so that, uh, not only the place in which you are speaking, but the entire environing space beyond uh, the confines of the frame beyond the confines of the scene uh, is somehow felt as present. That, I think, is an important part of Godard's um, kind of uh, confusion yes. of sound. That is to say, it, it involves a kind of defocusing, if I can say that, s by way of extending and stretching uh, the actual parameters of um, the space of the narrative and or that's the document. A, that's an aesthetic principle which uh, really can be spoken of in every other aspect of the film as well. I mean, I think you've traced it mm -hmm. extremely well with, with sound, but as Jonathan was saying just earlier, you can talk about characterization and the relationship to narrative in that kind of way. I mean, certainly the, what you were saying also, uh, Annette, about the visual texture of the, of the film, this notion of the old and the new, and this stretching, all of these things, uh, it, it's as if he takes something that is focused and uh, from there takes, not, not so much takes apart, as, as stretches both on one side or the other what mm. the possibilities of this may be. Well, I think that that uh, mixing up of ambient sound is really an attack on the conventions of Hollywood sound tracks. And I think he, he also does that consistently because he doesn't want to intervene in privileging. Oh, oh, I, I have to intervene because it's, it's that time again, okay? But it, it was that an appropriately Godardian interruption? I hope. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you'd like more information about cinema then, cinema now, or about cinema studies at the College of Staten Island, drop us a line. Drop it to cinema then, cinema now, the College of Staten Island, Staten Island, New York, 10301. Let me give you that information again, okay? Drop it to Cinema Then, Cinema Now, The College of Staten Island, Staten Island, New York, 10301. Well, Jonathan, I always hate cutting someone off, but at least we had an aesthetic context here that justified uh, the principle of sound, uh, sound editing. Uh, Annette, sorry that we had to cut you off as well in some way. Always a pleasure to have you uh, to have you here. Well, I hope that our discussion here, in fact, leads you to thought and discussion at home that you enjoy. That's certainly the principle of this film by Godard. I hope to see you again sometime. Bye bye. <laughs>